Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Tonight, I've got some interestingly modified guitars to share with you. We're going to start with this beautiful Les Paul Custom that was shared by Debius over on Instagram that he saw while visiting the 12th Fret Guitarist's Pro Shop. So at first glance here, this just looks like a beautifully aged natural Les Paul Custom. We can definitely tell it's Norland era because I see at least two seam lines here, which makes it a three-piece top. And that's just how Gibson made their guitars in the 70s and 80s. But what makes this one just a little bit extra special is the fact that, look, we've got a little bit of flame figuring right here. Same thing on this side. However, our centerpiece here appears to be a little bit more plain, at least in the Chateauian effect category, but it's got a lot of awesome wood grain. So it's just kind of like a cool combination of all the best things that you want on a Les Paul's top. But hey, there's a couple other things going on here. We have one, two, three humbucker pickups in here. Now that was an option that you could custom order on a Les Paul Custom, but now we've also got some sort of a Bigsby on here. Now it says Bigsby licensed, so I don't think it's the highest end Bigsby in the world. So that definitely means this is traditionally installed with giant screw holes in the top. And what we're seeing right here is the capped off original stop bar tailpiece. Looking over here, we've got reflector knobs. Now if those are stock, that would put this at like a 70 75, 76, maybe in early 1977, but it's kind of hard to tell from this one photo if those are vintage original knobs or if somebody's replaced it. But that's definitely the era when you find a lot of these three pickup customs, so this part could be original. However, if we come down here, we also see a mini toggle switch has been added. That was a very popular modification for doing coil splits. So the odds of these pickups still being like the original T-tops not very likely, but we can appreciate this guitar for what it is, even if we do have a little bit of a seam separation line going on here. But let's go over here and read our description. It looks like they're saying it's a stripped 70s Les Paul Custom, so that would imply it's been refinished. I guess I could believe that, but it must have been a long time ago. It's either that or somebody just put an aged nicotine finish over top of it to give it that aged natural look. But what's this about the owner didn't stop modifying there? Oh. <laughs> that's that's what they're talking about. Yeah, this is not the first time we've seen this on the show, but weirdly carving up these customs is just always a bizarre phenomenon. It's fascinating how far people took things back before these were like insanely expensive guitars. So we have a really rounded over cutaway here, and then we've got additional comfort carves here, kind of giving it a body-like figure to it. Not too much good that comfort cut's gonna do ya, unlike this one. But we've got these giant brass back plates on here, so that tells us this was likely done in the late 70s. But this one makes sense to have, but why that one? Flip back over to the other side, it's not like somebody converted this to lefty at some point. So that makes me wonder, A, did they just cut this out and do that for symmetry? Or B, did they put like pedal circuitry in this thing? You know, like how Gibson did the whole artist series of guitars with the Moog boards. Unfortunately, I do not have photos to confirm one way or the other, but they definitely stained this mahogany back. There's no way it was that red. But it looks like we can see the output jack is still in the regular location. They just probably had to modify the jack plate a little bit because they really rounded over this entire body. And hey, just to you didn't know, this is a Les Paul Custom. You've got the custom binding on the front. They sanded so much of the body, we no longer have any of the original binding on the back. <laughs> so they kind of just transformed it into like a custom light that was introduced in the late 80s. As far as other modifications, we've got Schaller strap locks. That's pretty tame in comparison to everything else. But oh my goodness, the fun doesn't end there. The headstock, they have this big brass plate back here. So the whole thing in the late 70s, early 80s was brass was big. That increases your sustain. So this company created these little cutouts so they would fit on your guitar. They would just be secured by the tuners on there. So you wouldn't have to have any other additional screws or modifications needed. So in theory, adding more mass to the back of your headstock right here increased your sustain. I think it'd be fun to try one of these things out. I've never had one, but I do see them occasionally. But what's kind of fascinating about all this is this still looks like the original finish on the neck. I guess I could be wrong because the volute does look slightly messed with in this photo. But in theory, they could have done everything else and not touched the neck. But that's a three-piece maple neck, which is also within this era. So that definitely tells us it's within the 75 through about 1982 era. So yeah, what an interesting piece. So I'm curious, what else does this 12th fret guitarist pro shop trying to sell here? 
Ooh, you know this place means business if they have a Kalamazoo award. So basically, the highest end arch top guitars, you know, the big fancy jazz boxes. You want a Kalamazoo award or some of the citation models. I mean, outside of the Les Paul, these are typically the most expensive New Orleans era guitars. But they're pretty tame in comparison to some of the things that the custom shop created in the late 80s and 90s. But it looks like we got a flying dove here, some sort of a olive branch i would imagine but the old style gibson logo done up in abalone we've got the same thing going on on our natural wooden pick guard floating jazz pickup another bird down here it'd be nice if they could have changed up the angles but whatever but it's always the backs where these things get crazy so you got some really tight flame action almost a little bit of bird's eye slightly mixed in there then you get your five piece maple neck on this and you get your stinger it's not as pointy as some people might like but it's because there's a volute on the back of the headstock and then you've got the additional custom emblem back here. Just like we saw when I reviewed the Legrand, which is a fancy guitar in its own right, but it's no Kalamazoo award. Next up looks like we've got a deluxe reverb. Is that new? I was hoping it was just really clean vintage. I've actually got one of these standing about 10 feet from me. Very iconic amps. Looks like we got a couple of Martin acoustics, but what caught my attention here is this sold Chet Atkins model. Oh, nice. That's one of the celebrity series ones. That's the one I always forget about. So the Celebrity series of Gibson was very early 90s. You can find the SG Standard, there's a Les Paul, there's a pretty cool Firebird that I do want to own one day. Heck, I guess while I'm at it, I might as well have one of every one for the museum, right? But this is the one that gets forgotten all about because it's not the most popular Gibson model to ever be created. But I'd say this Stratocaster is pretty cool. That's got all these 70s specs, very wood grain ash body. Oh my goodness, that's actually from 79? I thought that was some sort of a reissue. That is great grain for one of those. Holy cow. Very vibrant finish. I mean, if you're going to buy a 70s Stratocaster, you might as well get one that's beautiful. I don't know if I'd say the finish is beautiful on this one, but at least the wood grain's nice. Your personal thoughts may differ. Hey, what do we got going on here? A 78 stock chrome hardware cherry sunburst custom. This one's pretty worn. You got a little bit of finish wear right here, a couple of dings. You don't find the chrome option as often on Cherry Sunburst as you do all the other colors in the lineup. I think the only one that's a little bit even more rare to find that on is a white Les Paul Custom in the 70s. In fact, I really can't ever remember seeing one show up on the market, but occasionally you do find these Cherry Sunburst ones. However, I think if you're gonna do it, you should probably do it traditionally and get the gold. Oh my, what do we got here? A GR700 synth system with the matching G707 guitar. I don't see how that would be comfortable to play. I'd have to see somebody sit down and play with it or have it on the strap. It looks strange, but you know, maybe it's perfectly fine. Here's another cool one, the Les Paul Signature. I need to get one of these again for my own collection because when I had reviewed and demoed all the ones prior that I have on my channel, that was before I had a personal collection. These are my favorite sounding jazzy guitars. They're technically Les Pauls, and if you're familiar with the whole Les Paul recording models and that being his favorite guitar, imagine that but in a 335 that's offset, and that's exactly what these things are. They are just phenomenal sounding. But these are a nightmare to work on if something goes wrong. Because you gotta fish the stuff through the F-holes and they're a lot more complicated than normal. But this thing, it's got a vibe to it. That's cool. Usually these are in a lot cleaner shape. So finding one in this condition, it's not necessarily a bad thing if you can get it for the right price. Looks like they're asking $47.50. I mean, it's been a while since I've looked into the market on these. That's a little bit high, but if you ever see one of these things out in the wild, try it. Trust me, they're fantastic. Here's kind of an interesting one from Heritage. Heritage H120, 750 bucks. Wow, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So we've got some sort of like a roller bridge. We have like a TP6 tailpiece that doesn't have the fine tuners to it. It kind of reminds me of like some Ibanez used things. And then we have rubber gripper on our speed knob. Then we've got a V Les Paul styled tilting pickup ring. And then we've got the Florentine cutaway over here, which isn't what a Les Paul normally has. So it's like a, a Les Paul Junior butt on steroids. That's kind of interesting. I, I want to learn more. I didn't find any on reverb, but I found some sold ones. So apparently this is a late 80s model. It looks like they did indeed come stock with that stuff. Okay, they're a bolt-on neck. Not necessarily a marauder, but in the same vein. But 
apparently made in USA? That's really cool. That seems like a good deal on a USA made instrument. Maybe I'll have to find one of those one day. Oh my, they've got one of these. Okay, it's not one of the real ones from the 80s. If you need to learn about those, I have indeed reviewed one. It was a custom order, I think, for a guy named Dusty Stone. But it looks like this is a double neck version. 12 string, 6 string. I'm just talking that I had one that had four additional strings, not the whole double neck. But whoa, is that truly a double neck through guitar? I think that's the first time I've ever seen that. These things have so many electronics built into them. It's so hard to figure out what everything even does. But they can be fun to experiment with if you're open to it. That is a fascinating construction. Here's another fun 70s deluxe. Can you uh, find out what's wrong with it? Don't be shy. Give it a good look. Let me know. All right, you ready? Somebody's replaced this knob. And the bridge has been routed out for a humbucker. <laughs> You know, it's been done. You might as well enjoy it rather than complain about it on the internet. Sure, you can never take it back to the original mini humbuckers, but honestly, you might as well just throw a P90 in the neck position at this point and then just have a great time, you know, like the BFG. But you can definitely see a little bit of arm wear right here, but the rest does not appear to be in that bad of condition. Looks like we got our original frets yet. The back has some honest wear. And ooh, nice, it's a Kalamazoo built one too. You know, I don't actually want to be too presumptuous here. I would want to see the cavity routes because I was actually talking to Randy Leonard a couple of days ago about a cool custom color deluxe I had found. And he went through his ledgers and he actually found there is one stock Les Paul Deluxe out there that has a humbucker in the bridge and a mini humbucker in the neck. And then I don't remember 100% if that was the same guitar, but he also said there is a deluxe out there that is outfitted like a Les Paul Custom. <laughs> oh, the crazy custom orders of the 70s and 80s. But here's an interesting one SpongeBob might like. You've got a horse mixed with the dragon slash seahorse thing. <laughs> That's an interesting acoustic. I mean, it's got a clear pick guard on it. You've got abalone purfling around the entire edge, custom rosette, but the super sharp cutaway on an acoustic, but yet it's still pretty boxy right here. I wonder how comfortable that would really be. Here's kind of an interesting one, 2005 Les Paul Standard. I don't think I've seen that finish before. I think it might be called Santa Fe Sunrise. Well, here's one from 2004 that had faded to actually look pretty cool. But that was a slightly different model. These truly are the next big thing within the passing 10 to 15 years, I would say, because the 90s is starting to catch up in collector's interest. So if you want to get a head start on like your 2000s era stuff, people are going to get really nostalgic over these because these were the best standards before the original collection came out. So you got weird things like Latte Cream, you've got Gecko Burst, among a couple of other interesting ones. Look at this freaky guild from 1985, it's very pointy, but rounded at the same time. I like how the headstock matches it almost. It brings a different meaning to matching headstock. Wendell's got the spirit here. It's thrown me a curve. It's like the opposite of an explorer. Oh, and what shop isn't complete without a Gorky Park signature Kramer? <laughs> we talked about these a while ago too. Yeah, strange balalaika shaped guitar everyone else it's just a triangle and ah oh, here's a nice rare one so the early 90s they have all sorts of small catalog run guitars and this is one of the more popular ones regular sg standard but it has a nice dark metallic green color to it so very emerald like then you get the moto pick guard to match with the gold hardware these are seriously cool guitars. Add in the fact that 90s SGs are just built different. They have really dense mahogany wood, most of them. I mean, that's what the headless SG initially was. But there's our beautiful custom shop edition decal. How much do they want on that? Ooh, 28. Definitely pricey. But, you know, if you could talk them down to around 22, I think you'd be happy. Now there's a Jarrett Shelby Cobra. You know, if there was ever a guitar to look like a football helmet, I would say it was this one. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so bulbous. Like, what's going on there? Like, is that just part of the design? It looks like it's literally being inflated. And yet, it's trying to be so cool on the headstock. And I suppose to end out tonight's episode, maybe we check out this one. It looks like another nice jazzy arch top. <gasps> That's not Gibson. It's Ibanez. <laughs> I love Lawsuit 
lawsuit era Ibanez. I know there's not technically, but that's just what people call it, okay? So apparently this is a knockoff of the Gibson Johnny Smith model. But yet some of these are so well made, people claim that they're even better. I mean, for me, I just think it's funny because they like completely copied the headstock perfectly in a certain era before they had to change it. But this is what I like about 70s knockoffs is the fact that they still put their own brand on it. No one was trying to pass off Chibsons as Gibsons and actually put the branding on it. They put their own on there. They took the cease and desist letters and then they birthed their own companies. Now, obviously, Ibanez has a huge storied history, both pre and post this unscrupulous era, but they made some pretty cool Les Paul copies as well. So yeah. Yeah, when, when you start to get into the body shape, you can tell, yeah, that's definitely not a Gibson. But they nail the necks at looking pretty good. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.